Namaste. We are looking at the history of yoga. The history of yoga begins when mankind first started to ask the question, who am I? Now, in previous lectures, we have looked at the role of Adi Yogi, we've looked at the role of Krishna, and today, let's look at Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. He lived about 600 years before the common era, and is perhaps the most well-known person from the Indian subcontinent through history. We love and revere the Buddha because he represents this unique quality of man attaining to Nirvana. Before him, most of the spiritual masters were considered to be gods, were considered to be divine. With Siddhartha Gautama, the magic is not in being called divine. The real journey is in a man like you and me with all the trials and tribulations is able to transcend and this quality is very very important for us in the 21st century because we have that opportunity to get inspired, to learn from him and to go beyond. So let's get started. When Siddharth was born, he was born in a princely uh, family. Uh, his father was a clan leader. The Sakya clan was a small clan. And he was born in Lumbini, which is in today's Nepal. But the family, the clan was in the northern part of India. And he was told at that point, it was told by astrologers, that either he'll become a great sage or a great king. So his father had the self, not selfish, but had the motive as a father to ensure that he stays as a great king and doesn't leave and become a sage. So he kept him very secluded, he kept him in the palace with all the comforts known to a king. It is said, now we don't know, but it is said that he never left the palace for about 29 years. Everything was provided to him, he had a life of luxury. But on a given day, when he was 29, he stepped out of the palace because the father had ensured that he doesn't get a chance to go out. And he stepped out on his own and he saw four things. And that tremendously changed him. He saw a sick person. So he realized that health is ephemeral. He saw an old person suffering. He understood that youth is transient. He saw poverty and illness. He saw death. And very quickly, he understood that what he had based his life on is going to pass away. Health, life is all going to pass away. So it dawned on him that the nature of human life is suffering. Now, you and me, we have this realization every now and then, but we're able to continue with our life. For him, this was a deep and profound realization. And he said that I have to find out some solution to the suffering. Otherwise, it's going, to come, it's going to come to me. I'm going to get old. I'm going to get ill. I'm going to die. What is the nature of life if this is just going to happen? It's all very transient. According to the story, he left his house, his palace, on the day his son was born, on that night. Now, such was his deep burning desire to understand the nature of life that he couldn't stay on in the palace anymore. He couldn't stay on as a father. He couldn't play that role of a king. He left. For the next six years, he goes on an epic voyage of meditation, of self-deprivation, of all ascetic life as has ever been done. So he went and joined a school where deep meditation was the norm. Very quickly, he excelled. Now, here's a man who's not pursuing meditation as a hobby. This is what he wants. He's in the search for truth and nothing's going to stop him. He became so good at it that the teacher of the school asked him to join with 
equal respect as a teacher himself, as a teacher himself. But somehow, Siddhartha had the honesty to understand that even though he was excelling at meditation, the meditation technique, he was nowhere coming closer to the truth. The truth was still elusive to him. Now, a lot of us go on journeys of spiritual, spiritual journeys and we may not have the honesty, so we fight with our family, our parents, uh, our na uh, you know, friends and say, no, I'm going on this journey. When we don't get the result on that journey, we may not have the honesty to say that, listen, it didn't work. But Siddhartha had that honesty. He said, no, this is not working and he moved away. He joined another set, another school where they were starving, they were fasting rather. Fasting, self-deprivation, asceticism was a big part of the process. And he continued with this with a fellow band of students. There were about five of them and they were all sort of training, training, training for years. It is said that he had become so emaciated that one could see the skeleton. He was almost on the verge of collapse. Again, so the years had passed. So again he told himself, no, even this is not working. Even this is not getting me closer to the truth. Again, we find this deep sense of honesty in the person. So he gives up on that. At which point he faces the ridicule of his other fellow sadhaks. Because they say that you're giving up your, you're giving up your, sort of, uh, surrendering this journey. But he knows that it's not giving him the desired result. So he leaves. It so happens that a lady gives him a meal. He's not eaten for perhaps months. He eats that meal, relaxes, sits under a tree, uh, sits in meditation. Over the next 12 hours, what happens is one of the greatest things that has happened in the history of mankind. He's able to transform from being a meditator to go through the different realms of meditation over those hours and to eventually arrive at the end of that as an enlightened being. This journey that we all sort of aspire to is so beautifully depicted in his life. On that night, he attains to nirvana. Now it's important to understand what this means. The interesting thing in the Indian school of thought, we call it Sanatana Dharma, the original way of life, is this understanding that life is not linear. It's not birth, death, and then heaven or hell. It's cyclical. You're born through your practices of life, through the good deeds you do through life. When you die, you're born either as another human being, or if you've had a very sort of bad life, so to speak, you're born as an animal. The idea is that at some point I was a rock, I was an animal, I was a plant. The cycle of life keeps going on and on and on. How do you exit? When you reach a state of desirelessness, you've understood the nature of desire. When you reach that state, then you've reached to samadhi, moksha, moksha or nirvana. You've liberated from that cycle of birth and death. Very beautiful because if you die with some desire unfulfilled, you will have to be reborn to fulfill it. That is the understanding. That you're constantly reborn to fulfill the desires that you carry. But when you reach a point in your life where you've reached desirelessness completely, then there's no need for you to come back on the cycle of birth and death. He reaches this point of nirvana. He has understood the nature of desire itself. Now, he's attained, this is at age 35, he's now a Buddha. The first thing is that he goes back to find those five friends of his because he wants to share this. He's in bliss, but he has this beautiful, compassionate nature where he says that, I will keep coming back until everybody doesn't attain to Buddhahood, doesn't attain to Nirvana. 
He goes and finds these five students and he starts to teach them what he has understood. So they become his first disciples. This happens in Sarnath. It's in modern day Bihar. You have to go visit this place. It's so beautiful where he gave his first discourse. Now let's understand a little bit about what he teaches. Uh, in due course, he's going to teach more and more people. For the next 50 years, nearly 50 years, he travels as a mendicant, begging for his meal, teaching people. Now this is history's favorite child. And yet, he's begging for his meal every day, eating, teaching. He's got a clan then of about 70,000 monks who are living with him. Now what we want to understand is the essence of what he's teaching, the four noble truths. Now these four noble truths are this. In life, there is suffering. Suffering is real. If there is suffering, there has to be a cause. If there is a cause, then there has to be an end. This is the beauty of it. If there is an end, that means there is a path. This is what he calls the Four Noble Truths. This is what he teaches. There is suffering. If there is suffering, there is a cause. If there is a cause, there has to be an end. And if there is an end, there is a path. There is a Dharma. He starts to teach this. And he teaches the middle path. Yeah? A life that is not too extreme. Yeah? Like in yoga, we say not drink too, not eat too much, not eat too less, not sleep too much, not sleep too less. The unique, the beauty of this is that Buddha is perhaps the greatest psychologist to have ever lived. He understands that the ego is only in the extremes. You remember those students who topped your class or those who failed? In, the, in between, there's no glory. You remember those who were great at sports, those who were really terrible. Nobody in the average. That's the way the mind is. You want to either be the best or the most rebellious. But in, if you live a life where you're on the middle path, the ego comes to its standstill. There's no real pride that you can have. A lot of people, like in today's context, say, I'm vegan or I, I love meat. But what if you're a person who is in between? Sometimes, sometimes. You don't make that your identity, neither becomes your identity. This is just examples I'm giving, just to show you the mag the, the sort of, uh, the brilliance of the middle path. How clearly he understands that if you stay in the middle path, you can't really be very egoistic about this. The eightfold path, right intent, right sankalp, right thought, right word, right action, right way of living, right meditation, right samadhi. This is the teachings of the Buddha. The, the beautiful thing with the Buddha is that there's no miracles, there's no magic, there's nothing divine. It's pure, simple psychology. You do this, this happens to you. So what is the Buddha's greatest contribution to mankind? Take responsibility for your life. Up until his time, if there were no rains, you went to a priest, you did some, some rituals, for the rain gods. Now this was in India, this is in ancient Israel, in ancient Mexican civilization, wherever, animal sacrifice, rituals, rituals. With the Buddha, he says, all that is fine, but the question really is, what are you doing about your life? You cannot blame anyone. When he was asked the question about God, he says, that's not the important question, whether there's God or no. The important thing is that, what are you doing about it? So the, the focus, the responsibility is squarely upon you. Even 2600 years later, for us in the 21st century, we find it very difficult to take responsibility. We are blaming the gods, we are blaming the government, we are blaming our parents, we are blaming our spouse, we are blaming our employers, we are blaming everybody. We just don't like to take responsibility until you don't take that responsibility you have not yet understood the Buddha's message. Such a simple message. Take responsibility and what are you going to do about it? How are you going to come to the middle path? How are you going to find an end to your suffering? This is what he taught. And this is why we respect him so much across the world because of the simplicity and yet such a profound message. 
as part of the 21st century yoga project, we are trying to study the masters, trying to see whether what they taught is relevant for us in today's day and life. How can I incorporate the Buddha's simple, profound message in my work life, in my relationships, in everything that I do? I invite you to just take a little bit of time sitting in meditation to see whether you're taking responsibility for your life. What are those aspects of your life where you're not taking responsibility and blaming others? Can you take 100% responsibility for your own suffering? Only then can you find a solution. In the coming sessions, we're going to study Patanjali's role and then we're going to look at modern yoga from Swami Vivekananda, Swami Shivananda, Paramahamsa Yogananda, T. Krishnamacharya, B.K. Sayanga, Pattabhika, the legends of modern yoga. I hope you've been able to appreciate the Buddha's contribution to yoga, to mankind. Namaste.